My name is Akila Peoples. I'm CEO of Mental Health Research Canada. Delighted to welcome you here. I know we have uh, over 300 participants that registered uh, from all across Canada. So welcome and thank you for joining us uh, for this important topic. We're a national charity, uh, but I do want to acknowledge that our head office is in Toronto on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. And we are most grateful and respectful for the important history uh, of the land that we're able to use. Uh, we're very pleased today uh, to be once again focusing on workplace mental health and workplace wellness. Uh, this series is sponsored by the Beniva a large insurance provider. We're very grateful of their support. We'll be having additional events upcoming. Uh, and it's called, it starts at the top because we're focusing on CEOs and C-suite executives because we feel that mental wellness needs to not reside in HR solely. It may have some time ago, but now it's very important that all leaders are thinking about making sure that they are doing the best they can to provide psychologically safe workplaces. So welcome to It Starts at the Top. We're very excited to have country managers from Google and Starbucks today. And I know you're really going to enjoy hearing from them. I've had the opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one with them. I can tell you they are compassionate people leaders who care deeply about the people that they work for. A couple of uh, quick items before I uh, briefly introduce our, our uh, speakers today. Um, there are free resources on our website that uh, anyone can use. They're easy to find. Uh, they're produced by many credible organizations. So I encourage anyone listening who wants some very accessible and free resources on workplace wellness and mental health to go to our website at mhrc.ca. Also want to note that the chat function is open and I will do my best uh, to try to monitor it and ask a few questions um, towards the second half of our time together. Uh, please put the questions in the chat rather than the q and A. I'd prefer that so we don't have to monitor, uh, monitor both. Lastly, we're recording today's session. Uh, and if you know anyone who wanted to attend that couldn't, the link will be available on our website in the next few business days. Uh, so we're very pleased to be able to provide that uh, for anyone that uh, wasn't able to attend today. So very briefly, I'm going to uh, introduce Lori de Gula and Sabrina Jermaya. And I will say these two accomplished leaders, of course, uh, have, have resumes that I cannot do justice to in a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to highlight a few things from the resume and I'm actually gonna turn over to them to introduce themselves uh, on a more personal level. And maybe they can also share why they're uh, enthusiastically participating in this important event today. So first, Lori Degula, Senior Vice President and General Manager for Starbucks Canada. Uh, Lori joined Starbucks in 2017, became General Manager of Canada just before the pandemic in February 2020. Uh, she has an impressive resume with uh, senior roles with many known companies, uh, well-known companies in the United States and Canada, including Accenture, Nine West Shoes, Wegmans Food Market, and Lowe's, where she led the company in its first international expansion and subsequent exponential growth into the Canadian market. She's a Queen's Engineering alumni, a lifelong athlete, and a dedicated board member uh, for the Canadian Women's Hockey League. Uh, welcome, Lori. Uh, very pleased uh, to have you here. And also uh, joining Lori is Sabrina Jeremiah, uh, who heads up Google Canada. Uh, Sabrina has more than 25 years of international marketing and technology sales experience, including general management at Procter & Gamble, where she, she managed the cosmetics um, uh, PL for Italy. Also, she was at Reket Benkiser, where she drove the first global internet strategy based out of the UK. Uh, Sabrina is also a volunteer board member of many organizations, including the Business Council of Canada, and an award winner, uh, notably from the Women's Executive Network, where she was named uh, one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women. I'm so pleased and grateful that both of you have taken time out of what I know are very busy schedules to share with us uh, some of your thoughts on this very important topic today. So I thank you on behalf of myself and MHRC. We're delighted uh, to be talking to you today. Um, so I'd like to turn over first to Sabrina and then to Lori, and maybe you could tell us just a little bit more about yourself. Uh, obviously, my intros were brief and uh, share why you thought it would be important for you to participate today. 
Well, first of all, thank you for uh, having me. And thank you for also having this conversation. I think your point on, you know, it, it starts at the top and uh, this isn't something that just is supposed to live in an HR. It's for all of us to model. And I think, you know, I think the importance of this right now is, is really important. I mean, there was a stat that someone shared with me that I think uh, one out of two Canadians is going to have some sort of mental health issue by the time uh, that they're 40. Uh, and a lot of the things that were challenging in the past have really been exacerbated uh, by the pandemic. And Akila, the, um, the research that you shared on just the devastating impact on healthcare workers uh, in certain sectors of the economy was really eye-opening and sadly not surprising. So, you know, when we think about it from a work uh, perspective too, mental illness is the leading cause of disability in this country. So it is something that um, maybe we didn't talk about en enough in the past and we didn't make space for it. And I think one of the bright lights of the past two years is that we've really started looking at mental illness and talking about it more, uh, destigmatizing it and being there for one another. I think there's just been a giant wave of empathy that the past two years um, have created. And, you know, despite the fact that the pandemic has deteriorated our mental health, uh, we've all experienced it together and we're experiencing both the, pen, you know, the, the situation that we're in and our mental health in different ways. And it's just made us so aware of it. So, you know, I'm very passionate about this because for us, like at Google, it's about putting the wealth, health and the well-being of our, our employees first. And this is just such an important conversation to have. Great. Thank you so much for, for those comments. And of course, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, thank you. Lori, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Akil. And thank you as well. Uh, you know, I'll share for creating the space to have this conversation is really, really important. <clears throat> so thank you for your leadership. And I agree with Sabrina completely. I mean, it is so important and it has accelerated and amplified so much in the last couple of years. But of course, it has existed since the beginning of time. You know, and for me, you know, there's a you know, there's sort of an intellectual part of why it's really, really important, but then there's also a very personal part of why it's important. I think that's also what fuels us to really go after and make a big difference. And um, and so both of those is what drives me today in in creating space for this conversation to try and make a real difference. It's one of the reasons that I was attracted to Starbucks in the first place because it does care so much. It very much is a people centered company. It cares as much about the work we do as how it feels doing this work and mental health is such a big part of that. You know, one of the things that Sabrina said, you know, in her comments, it, it is really, really important. And it's it's everything around that individual as well. It's not only their mental health, but of their family, of their leaders, of their community, it all contributes together. So the job is really important. Um, our, our role as leaders and companies is so much important because it's not something that the government can be, be able to do because we have such an intimate relationship with so many people across the country and their extended family families is really important as well. Um, and, you know, the, the ability to be successful um, as, a, as an individual, as a company, as a, a provider of valuable services and whatever, whatever lens we do is only possible if people feel great, feel psychologically safe, um, feel strong and able to do their best work and show up the very best they can for the people next to them. And that's where it starts to have a ripple. So this is incredibly important for me. Um, we've been able to do so much already um, and there's so much more to do. So that's why this conversation is really exciting for me. Thank you. And, and I think we all do our best work when we are supported to be our best selves. Uh, so very, very well said there, Lori. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start uh, by talking a little bit about both companies uh, and I, because I'd really like the audience to know uh, some of the impressive um, supports that you have for your employees. Uh, so I'd like to start uh, with a little bit of a conversation about Google and a little bit of history for the audience. Uh, in December 2021, uh, Google celebrated its 20th anniversary of Google arriving in Canada. Uh, it started in, in 2001 with a single hire in a small workshop space in Toronto, uh, then expanded to Montreal and then to Waterloo. Now, I believe you have over 3,000 employees and you're heading towards 5,000. Uh, and I know along the way you have contributed more than 25 million to many Canadian nonprofits and STEM programs. Um, you have a very strong commitment to mental health and wellness at Google. It's one of the reasons that you're here today and we're so delighted about that. 
And I have a list of a, just a few of your supports, employee assistance programs focused on mental health, workplace accommodations for physical and mental health concerns, on-site wellness centers, access to mental health apps, medical advocacy programs for transgender employees, flexibility and time off, including global reset and well-being days, a hybrid work model, two days work from home uh, for most roles, remote work opportunities, uh, four work from anywhere weeks per year. How's that? That's very exciting. Uh, Part-time work and job sharing options, uh, fertility and growing family support, parental leave and baby bonding leave. And, and the list goes on, uh, Sabrina, very impressive. I mean, it was even great to see videos of your employees online talking about all the googly extras that they get through working with Google. Um, just, just one other comment, uh, and then I'll have a comment, but um, I've been to your Toronto office about 12 years ago, um, and I realized that each of your locations has its unique designs, office traditions, uh, great food for your employees, uh, ping pong, animals, comfy lounge chairs. I mean, that was 12 years ago. Um, I'm wondering, was Google better prepared when the world shut down uh, and we all of a sudden had to pivot instantly to working remotely? You folks already had a unique culture because you're not a conventional company. Were you better prepared? Did you make that transition? Was it easier for your employers because of the tremendous supports that they have? Yeah, that's such a good question. I mean, one of the things is, uh, you know, our work is digital. And the interesting thing is that we create a lot of the digital tools that connected Canadian businesses. So we have, um, uh, you know, Google Workspace, which is Gmail and Google Meets and Hangouts. We have Google Classroom that powers a lot of the education systems in Canada. So for me, when when we all had that 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 wild month of March 2020, when we were trying to figure it out, there was a lot of decisions we made quickly, but one of the things that was easy was when we when we had this message, we were all gonna go home. And at the time it was, you know, for a few weeks and let's see what happens. And we know the tale that spun from that. It was, I went home, I literally cleared out a back room. I plugged in a monitor and I plugged in my laptop and I, you know, grabbed some water and some snacks next to me and that was it. Like we were plugged in because already this hybrid work, I was doing it probably 50% of the time from the office. And what wasn't clear was that half of the, the companies in Canada just didn't have the setup. So that was why we sort of created free workspace for everyone at that beginning, why we you know, pushed so hard on training teachers on Google Classroom. So I think that like technologically we were set up, but culturally it was a huge adjustment. Um, you know, and I think what we forget was how scared everybody was at the beginning and how much there was new, like even this concept of social distancing and you know I, I I wonder and Akila you could probably tell me you're the, you're the professional here if a lot of the mental health issues that we're facing is because we were separated from our communities the people we loved and our support mechanisms so we tried to compensate with that it was funny that your work community became such a source of support and I think also your relationship with your manager created such a support. And we really, really encouraged people to check in, to listen, to see where people were at when they moved into this new environment, faced with all this new and fears. And I think that was something that was a big shift. It was already there, but like, you know, everybody checks in at every meeting now when they're having a one-to-one. -one. I think that's such a powerful tool. No, it was impressive in your founder's letter in uh, 2004 uh, when for your IPO letter to potential shareholders, it actually states our employees are everything. And yeah. it goes on to talk about the, you know, sort of unusual benefits and uh, that shareholders should expect that you're going to add benefits rather than pare them down over time. Clearly out of the gate, you folks have been employee centric uh, in a highly unique way. And I just want to congratulate you on that. Um, obviously, you understand the, the strong connection between healthy employees uh, physically and mentally uh, and, um, you know, a strong business culture and business success. So I turn over to Starbucks uh, for a moment, Lori. Um, so Starbucks, uh, 1987, your first uh, store in Canada was in Vancouver. Uh, 1988, you offered full extended health care and dental benefits to all eligible full and part time uh, employees, including a mental health benefit. In 1998, 1998, wow, was I ever impressed with that when I was doing my research. 
2016, you offered an unprecedented $5,000 a year mental health benefit for all employees working a minimum of 20 hours a week. That was the highest of any Canadian company across uh, all industries at the time. How impressive is that? That for you know decades, Starbucks has known how important this is. 2019, you declared mental health matters in an effort to acknowledge and break stigma. And 2020, you reimagined your mental health care benefits far beyond uh, what would be considered normal EAP standards uh, with digital wellness uh, programs and apps and uh, dedicated mental health training. Uh, I think now you have more than 23,000 employees that I think you call partners, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, over 1,500 stores. And the ethos of your company seems to be caring for your people and caring for your customers. How proud are you of all of that? Well, I mean, I, I joined the company with that already had a very strong legacy, right, from the founders. You know, it was always a company that considered itself um, a people company serving coffee, not a coffee company serving people, right? And that's really the, the center of everything we do is that, you know, no experience will be better than the experience that the partners have. So everything we do is through that lens. And certainly our aspiration is to continue to challenge ourselves to do that better and more collaboratively all the time. So, you know, I'm exceptionally blessed to have joined a company um, at the time that I did where that was already so ingrained in the culture and the trajectory of what mattered and, and what, how we define success. So when the pandemic hit, that was the strength that we were able to build on. And Sabrina, it was fascinating hearing the strength and the opportunity that you experienced and the strength and the opportunity, because all companies are like that, um, for sure. So, you know, for us, as you know, the pandemic came, and the, you know, the biggest, I would say the biggest strength for us is that we are already oriented fully to partner experience. And it's what we talk about all the time. It's part of our decision criteria and, you know, and how our expectations are of our leaders. And so the piece that was seamless for us was the piece around working together, having conversations about how we feel, co-creating solutions around things, you know, that was seamless for us. So as people started to feel scared or as people were worried about work or, or losing their jobs or anything, the opportunity or the ease with which we said, let's just come together. Let's just have a family meeting and let's talk this out. Let's understand what we might be able to do, what's most important to you. And that's where we learned very quickly, you know, what mattered most right now. And so, you know, when we had to close stores like all other retailers or, you know, brick and mortar people did, we were able to understand what did they need most, right? And so caring for them, making sure that they were paid, understanding that they had a job when they come back, really having those conversations um, is where we leverage the strength of our culture um, to get through some of those those hardest times and then co-creating what that meant coming out of it. So co-creating, you know, what tools and digital tools that you need and being able to access many of those from providers, um, you know, even just the hybrid work model. What does that mean? What does flexibility mean in this new world? You know, we expanded our, our digital platforms to take care of uh, family members and, and kids because we knew I would only feel as good as my child feels or my significant other feels or my extended you know, community feels. So really through the pandemic opened the aperture of what caring for a partner meant. It meant caring for everybody that they cared about as well. And that was a really exciting way to be able to lean into mental health, psychological safety um, and feeling the whole person, the whole person is healthy and, and feeling mentally um, successful as well. So that's a little bit of a theme in talking to other CEOs is that now it's not just about the individual, it's about their family and everyone around them because that's so much a part of them being uh, their best self is that, you know, hoping everybody around them is safe and happy and healthy. Uh, I'm hearing we're starting conversations differently these days. Is that true for both of you? Yeah, I think so. Work? I think so. I mean, it was funny. I, I just had a co an interaction with a colleague and we were jumping right in and I just stopped. I said, hang on a second. Let, let's just do a quick check in. How are you doing? And then suddenly this kind of little gem of what was going on in the background of their life, which is the most important thing appeared, right? And I think that was really important to understand in the context that we were in. Um, and I think that's that's so, so, so important. Um, the other thing is, is just like really, really encouraging people to put their well-being first. And I think that that is super critical right now because everyone 
is feeling uh, burnt out and stretched, right? There are a lot of challenges, I mean, especially in sectors um, like healthcare, et cetera, but across the board. And so we spent a lot of time also talking about resilience. Uh, we actually have a global head of resilience. Her name is Lauren Witt. Um, she, there's a great blog post on her. You can uh, do a Google search on Lauren Witt resilience. And she did her PhD on this and she was a former athlete. And she actually came to talk at one of our all hands and uh, she, she gave a couple of tips that for me, I just started to personally try out. And one of the ones that stuck with me was establish a morning routine. And so in January in that really deep dark time, I don't know if you remember it, where we all got shut down again in Canada and it was minus 20 out. So there was really nowhere to go. You know, your kids were at home. It was like, and it felt like the US and other places were not in the same boat as us. And it was kind of um, a really tough moment. And I was like, she, she talked at that time. And I went, okay, I'm gonna try this. So I started getting up and just thinking, even if I do 10 minutes, like 10 minutes and just make it a routine, it doesn't need to be like an hour. It doesn't need to be anything that like is, you know, so aspirational. And I started noticing that the days I did it, my mental health and my outlook were better. And I thought that that was such a great tip. And she has like a whole bunch of other ones, like, you know, taking breaks throughout the day, sleep schedule, being intentional about the stories that you tell yourself. But I think this notion of one, understanding people on your team, encouraging them to prioritize their health, but then also role modeling it and trying it on yourself. You have to experiment with yourself a little bit because uh, we're all different and, and different things work. Lori, are you starting conversations differently? Yeah, I think some, I mean, it, I think they're slightly different in the sense that, you know, Starbucks, we've always talked about how we feel, right? It, it's, it's just so much of who we are. And I remember when I first joined the company and I did my immersion and I started meeting people at the end, I was like, okay, now I got to meet with them again because we didn't talk about business, right? And it's just, right. that part was very natural for us. So that was the part that was really seamless, the, the checking in, the how you feeling, what's getting in your way, you know, all that type of stuff was really good. Where I feel like we we leaned in in a really deeper, more courageous way was some of the big societal things people were, were working through and dealing with and just creating the space and putting them on the table, whether it was, you know, the experience that we all went through, I mean, worldwide, but certainly North America and the U.S., um, around George Floyd and everything that came out of that, whether it was around the residential schools and, you know, the, the experience right. we were having as Canadians and wherever you were on how you connected with that. I think those were the really bigger conversations that we had collectively to really talk about it. We uh, stood up several more partner networks, so community networks around um, things like um, our Indigenous partner network or our Black partner network, some of those communities where we wanted to really understand and educate and share and listen and just create space, you know, for those for those real raw, real conversations and ensuring that they were safe. Those were, I think, some of the, I wouldn't necessarily say new, but deeper, more raw, more vulnerable, whether regardless of who you were in, because that was all part of it. The the, you know, there was the there was the pandemic for sure that was creating all this stress, whether it was, you know, worried about finances or worried about your own health or the isolation, Sabrina, that you talked about so well that was really real caused by the pandemic but it was on this landscape of so much more that was happening as well and so that was a really big one that I think changed for us that we really added to our collective conversation and the things we talked about and then teams would take that back they would be exposed to learning resources they would join networks and really help themselves through it in different ways. And then I think the other thing we did was around um, our leaders, helping our leaders be able to talk and coach their teams through mental health, regardless of the, where they were on the continuum. Sometimes it just might be stress or anxiety. Sometimes it might be real, um, like real struggles that they needed a different kind of support. So giving the space and the permission, regardless of what leader you were for your team, is teaching people how to create that space so that they could have the conversation. And so I think those were some of the newer, um, but very powerful conversations that we had differently that the pandemic, I think, accelerated. So I'm sure there are some people listening thinking, wow, I wish I worked in a company culture like this at Google or Starbucks. Uh, culture is so important. 
uh, and clearly um, you both embody the kind of culture that your, your corporations have. Um, how do we go about changing workplace cultures in organizations that aren't quite so employee centric or don't have leaders like yourselves? I mean, I think some of the lessons that Lori, I mean, Lori, you know, everything you just said resonated with me because it's it's it it's the same playbook. And I think if you're a large, a smaller, medium sized company, I mean, what Lori just described, and you know, a lot of the same tools, I think they can be replicated anything. And you know, I think is just having an intentional culture that prioritizes mental health. Uh, the first thing starts with creating a space to share stories, and I totally agree with that. And anybody can do that. And we have become more accustomed to it and it destigmatizes things that need to be talked about. And it, there's a fine line because you need to, um, people need to want to share their stories, right? And uh, we've had some people share very brave stories in very large forums. Um, we've had guest speakers in like Mary Deacon who uh, leads mental health efforts at Bell. Um, we, there's a one Google internal person that actually runs a workshop called Leading with Empathy. And then there's a lot of stories that come out in your one-to-one -one interactions that are based on psychological safety and trust with the people that you work with. So that's just sort of a cultural thread that anyone can replicate. I think, I think the second one is investing in your leaders um, to be setting the tone on that and empowering them because it's a fine line on having these conversations and also encouraging someone to get help when they need it from um, a professional. And I think that that's a really important thing to help uh, leaders understand, right? Is how do you listen? How do you help? And how do you understand the resources at hand to help someone when they need it the most? And then I think there's a third aspect is just thinking about resilience, right? And opening up the space of um, resilience in difficult time, but knowing that Throughout a day, every conversation that you're having with members on your team, you might be using different tools depending on where they're at. Yeah, I think that I think that's great, Sabrina. I agree with all of those as well. And you know, the the one thing that I would um, I would add to that as well is just authenticity, right? Like, no matter who you are in the company, particular if you're a leader role or if you're the leader in the room, is you have to lead like you want the team to be, and uh, and that's really important. So if you want the team to be able to share stories, if you want the team to be vulnerable, so you can get at the real things that they need, um, if you want the team to be a listening and learning culture around some of these important evolutions or mental health, then, then that's how you've got to show up as well. So really authentic. It can't be just words on a piece of paper. It can't just be through programs, although certainly programs help and they're enablers, no question about it. But that authenticity is really is critical as well. And then I would say the other one that's really important when you think about culture, because Sabrina, you're absolutely right. All this is you can replicate this. Some of these best practices you can absolutely do. You don't have to create it for your partner, your employees, create it with your employees, mm -hmm. sit down with them and design it. What would it feel like? What would a great meeting feel like? What would a great training program feel like? What would, it, and that's where you're going to get at the real nuggets because no one knows what they need more than them. And, uh, you know, I remember when we had a, back when we came up with a $5,000, um, uh, benefit on mental health. The reason it came, we didn't go in thinking, okay, mental health's an issue, we need to do it. We actually had these open forums across the country and we invited not only partners in that, so that generation, that that the, the meat of, of, the, of the age group that works at Starbucks in, in their retail stores, but we invited their friends. And because it wasn't about Starbucks, it was about what do you need? Like as a human, as a person in this generation, trying to make it in the world, if it's your first entry away from your parents, parents are in a big city because they had their nuances, right? Depending on where they were. What's most important for you? What are your dreams? How can we help you with those dreams? And that's where the nuggets really come out. It's not necessarily around something specific. And then you can figure, okay, what are we great at, right? So Sabrina, you'd say, okay, Google, like, oh my gosh, you're great at so many things. How do you take your strengths and go after it, right? And Starbucks did the same thing. So I guess the point that I love to add to Sabrina's is don't take the pressure of thinking you got to figure it out. There's partners that can help you, that there are your employees that will be on this journey with you if you invite them. And so invite them and co-create together, it's a huge difference. 
So I'm going to go back to that point in a moment about not, not having to figure everything out all at once. Uh, but I, so I'm hearing you're co-creating um, your, you're evolving your workplace mental health, workplace mm -hmm. wellness programs by co-creating them, by listening uh, to your partners and employees, partners mm -hmm. being your employees at Starbucks. Uh, is that the same for Google? You have a sort of a mechanism to get input and feedback or how do we measure programs? How do we know we're being successful with the programs that we have? Yeah, we have a core base of different programs that are provided at the corporate level. And then we have a lot that are co-created. Um, there's a lot of employee resource groups. Um, there are culture groups. And May was mental is was me mental health month. So for example, we had a series of program that was co-created by leaders in the business, right? Where we had um, speakers come in. We had detachment, um, detachment workshops. Uh, we had people you know, promote a lot of the benefits we have and a lot of the tools we have. There's a really fun one uh, that we have a tool that you can go in and, and actually it scrapes you, it looks at your calendar and says, here are places you can actually plug in online fitness classes if you want. There's a self-diagnosis team on anxiety where nothing is shared, but it's for you to go through and be like, oh, that, you know, that's a helpful thing. Um, things like apps, et cetera, like Sleep.io, right? Like I, I, I tell my team often I've used that in, in some times and how helpful it is in moments where maybe sleep, which is the core of everything, is a bit elusive to you, right? And so like a lot of these things are there or a lot of these things can be created. And so you wanna, you wanna give it to the team to embed it into your culture and embed it into moments and just create optionality. Like no one goes to every single one of these, but if you go to one or you're curious and you go to check something out, that's a step. Uh, Cause you wanna, you know, you're not alone. Like everybody is struggling at some certain time in their life and at work. And we're here for you and there are resources for you, right? And I think the pandemic has made it more comfortable for everybody to talk about things in a way that we didn't before. So even though we've all been through this, you know, horrendous experience, I, I think there's some silver linings in the cloud. You know, I think maybe we've made some steps uh, towards uh, decreasing stigma because everybody's now talking about it. And I, I believe almost every Canadian now truly understands the, the importance of good mental health in a way many of us didn't before the pandemic. We maybe knew somebody else or somebody at work or somebody in our family circles. Now we seem much more comfortable talking about things, uh, which I think is a very positive thing because stigma you know, is uh, very challenging uh, to, um, uh, to decrease. A couple of um, questions in the chat. Uh, somebody wanted, uh, Sabrina, could you mention again, you, you said leading with empathy, a workshop session or something or a reference or two. Could you mention that again? Somebody was interested. Yeah, to this is an internal course that's led by one of our Googlers. I actually did a post on it on LinkedIn. If you want to um, take a look on LinkedIn and just like look for the one that's on leading with empathy. So this is a really great one. This is someone on our team who has spent a lot of time thinking about it and gives it to us in a very raw way. And there's just a couple of tips that really strike home with me. The idea of like when a leader, like when you have your chat mechanism and you ping someone on your team and you go, hey, how much stress that causes the other person, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're a leader and you're just in the middle of the day. You're like, hey, and then and then you you disappear for five minutes or whatever. So just don't do that. Like, you know, that's <laughs> one example of a really good little tip. Another one she gave is about listening. And she this like just such an amazing headline. Listen like you're watching a sunset. Wow, and that's powerful. Isn't that powerful? And the idea that when you ask someone, how are you doing? You really do need to listen to that answer and look for the cues. And in this kind of like, I call it the Hollywood squares of virtual working, uh, is, is you lose a lot of signals when you're in person. So there are all these different right. kind of aspects. And someone in here says like, you know, do you feel that leaders have forgotten empathy? I don't have a view of this. I would almost say that at least in the culture that I operate in here, I think it's uh, the last while has really ratcheted up the empathy. Um, but I think that's right. different um, everywhere. Yes. Uh, another question uh, from a 911 operator asking on how to help employees suffering from burnout, particularly in a role like theirs where they can't just 
take a break since they can't miss an emergency. That's a tough one. Any any mm -hmm. thoughts from your experiences on that? Yeah, we, we've experienced something similar from our retail organizations for our leaders that are on the front line, right, and serving those customers. And not only is it, you know, there's customers in line and there's pressure around, you know, the expectation for them, but also the pressure they feel about not letting their partners down, their team down by walking away and taking a minute, right. even though their team would understand we do experience a lot of that from our partners. And so some of it is around um, ensuring that the leaders, the managers, so I'm sure in, in the 911 unit, there's, there's pieces like that as well, but it, it less about asking if you need it and more about requiring it, right? So requiring in this moment, based on the experience that you just had, we actually, we require you to go into the back room and take a break, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's taking the pressure of making the decision off them. And one way that feels not right because it's not empowering, but but because we know they feel so much pressure to serve and be there and show up um, to care for others, because that's what we trained them to do, is, is the leader. And then also we, we did a lot around um, de-escalation training and how in the moment, and there's, there's great organizations around that, is how in the moment do you help that not only the situation, but help yourself stay calm in that situation as well. So those are the, some of the things that we've been able to do to equip our teams with similar similar type of um, of tools to be able to manage through it because it's 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 challenging you have the added complexity of uh, perhaps customers coming into the store uh, mm -hmm. who need help or support mm -hmm. and so therefore your employees or partners as you call them need to also be available and ready to identify and support customers who may need some mental health support so that's that's another sort of added complexity I think of um, the job and the role we certainly uh, do I'd like to turn a little bit to you both and your leadership specifically in terms of how you walk the talk. Um, is there any skill, activity, or attribute that you've really relied on to get through this pandemic? I mean, I, I, I've leaned in on the listening and just thinking about the listening. And, and if you really just think about that as a tool, I don't, we don't always do it very well, right? Because we're all moving really quickly. Um, and active listening is something to practice. But the other thing is, is just Lauren Witt's tips, which is just a really great article to read. And it kind of ladders a little bit on to um, the last question. Sometimes the daily habits that you can cultivate around mindfulness are such a, um, they, they pay out in dividends. And especially if you're going into kind of, you know, I think she said once, right? Everyone always thinks that we're in a marathon. You're not in a marathon. You run sprints. And what do sprinters do? They prioritize recovery. And that was such a transformational way of thinking about that for me. So something as simple as Headspace, like a meditation app. Um, you know, last night I went for a walk and I listened to a meditation. And these little things that you can do in terms of like uh, daily habits can really go a long way, but also prioritizing recovery. You take your vacation days, detach from work, uh, try not to do it. I mean, I, as a leader, I do my best not to email people. We have this feature on Gmail called Schedule Send. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people get emails from me on a Monday at 8 a.m., but they don't hear from me on a Saturday and Sunday because I think about them with their kids at the park and right. they really don't want to hear from me when they're at the park with their kids. And I want them to be great parents and I want them to be great friends and community members. And that matters to me. So unless it's urgent, um, it's, it's, it's schedule sense. So it's like sometimes little habits that you can build in can go a long way. The right to disconnect. <laughs> I know some provinces have been focusing on that. Sorry, Lori, go ahead. No, I think that's great. I mean, Sabrina, I think you're, I think you're bang on a lot of those, though, you know, the word I would use is, is, and it's an old one, but it's so true in the space is leading by example, right? If you're working on your vacation, your leaders, your teams are going to expect that that's what's expected of you, right? And so really holding yourself accountable and setting the bar high because their bar will always, you know, they won't exceed, right? So in terms of that, the permission to do it, setting, you know, by example, um, is a big one for sure. And it took a little bit, you know, it took a little bit for me to give you know, the beginning of the pandemic. Oh my God, how do I walk away? Right. But I needed it. My kids needed it, right. you know, everything. Yes. So I get it, but that's really important. And then, you know, I would say the, 
you know, for me, the open and vulnerable, it, it was massive, you know, through the pandemic and my ability to lean in on, on that even more and be really authentic. I remember, um, you know, it was, uh, I guess it was just a, a year really into the pandemic a year. And we had a conversation where I could feel everyone like the, the, the emotions were being kept in and we needed to let them out. We needed to process them and move past them. And the way it did it was just sharing my own, right? And that really creates, like with purpose, it creates a really important conversation. So opening up that space was, was a really big one. And then, you know, the other piece that I would say um, even more so as well is, is the, you know, my role to serve, right? My role to serve my team, my role to serve our partners, my role to serve um, the, the customers, right? It's, it's not about knowing. There's lots of people we can bring together to know the right thing to do. It's about how do we serve? How do I ensure that we're talking about the most important thing to talk about? How do I ensure we're working on the most important things that line up to the most important work and results that we need? That is even more so my role, I think, over the last little bit. And the one I added to it in the pandemic was how do I serve myself? And that's a lot about what you said, Sabrina, because if I'm not at my best, I'm not taking care of my Myself, how can I possibly show up with the energy and the clarity that my team right. needs me to as well? So that was a new one I added, and a lot of I, I have a lot of the same <laughs> the same little learnings that I had, and I leverage every day as well. Have all these experiences changed either of you as a leader? Yeah, I think so. Like, I mean, and uh, look, we're still experimenting as we go. Like, we we're just back into like full on hybrid this week, and um, for some people, that's amazing. And for some people, that's uncomfortable, right? And I think we're so much more aware of meeting people where they're at at the moment. And I think there's like, there's something in the vulnerability of the past few years that you've just encountered so much and you've had different conversations with people and people have shared different stories that you've never heard that I think does change you, right? And I think it, it does change. It makes you realize like, this is this has been a really interesting two years just to understand um, how much we need to support one another to get through difficult times. Um, so I, yeah, definitely has changed you, changed me as a leader for sure. Lori, yeah, I think it. I think it has as well. I think what you said, meet people where you are, where they're at. I'll build on that. I think the biggest learning for me is just how different people can be on any given subject, right? And so it's not just meeting where they're at on one continuum. They could actually be on different continuums, right? And that was a really important. Neither of them being right or wrong, just different and very personal, um, because it it had so much to do with it. So that was, I think, a real big evolution in mine is how. So why do I open the aperture to understand where people are really at and then lean into it? And then I think so, you know, one of the other ones is just the, the, you know, the unequivalency around what's most important, right? And when I think of some of the things that our partners experienced or what, what's the, what is it they need most, and there's always a business, there's always a business impact to it, right? It, it, they always cost money or there's always a choice that needs to be made. And it's a less about how can we, but almost like how how could we not? How could we not do these things that are most important? So I think there's a degree of um, tenacity or defiance that is like, this is what is needed. So how will we figure it out? And the team has unlocked some incredible stuff with our benefits and our training programs and just what's possible in terms of our partner experience in the stores. Um, that has been a, you know, a shift as well um, because everyone wants to do great work. And everyone wants to. And so how do you unleash them to be able to do their very best against the most important stuff? And I think that's the piece that I've, I've just gotten more focused on through this as well. Create a supportive runway for people to succeed. Uh, question in the chat, have either of your teams considered uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion when designing your mental health initiatives? And if so, how? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is like another thing that it, it is really important to focus on that. Um, and to think about, again, meeting everyone where they are at. And, you know, we, we've looked at diversity, equity, and inclusion in a lot of ways. We've just published our 2022 diversity report. So you can have a look at the progress that we've made and the programming that we've made. And I think some of the things we've learned is things like onboarding. Um, if you come from certain underrepresented groups, we discovered that maybe it was a different experience for you. 
So we've started investing, for example, in Canada in uh, special onboarding programs that allow people to really kind of, uh, you know, to really feel like this is tailored for them. Uh, the other thing is, is we've done a lot of work on DEI externally in the community. So a lot of work on skilling and digital skills with a focus on underrepresented groups. So there's things like Empower um, and Inspire, these partners that we have that offer Grow with Google career certificates. So these are these micro credentials. And I, I meet with a lot of um, the graduates from these. And the, these were a lot of people who have worked in maybe a different industries are looking to reskill or upskill. And what I thought was so amazing when I and, and focus on scholarships for underrepresented groups was how they talked to me about the impact that the skilling had on their life and their mental health. And I feel that just so uplifting and amazing that sometimes that, that notion of a purpose, when you're having a hard time and trying something new, how much that can lift you. And, and then, you know, being able to then transition to uh, a job that you really enjoy uh, was, that's been so motivating for me to, to listen to those stories. A uh, question uh, from the chat, what role does peer support play in workplace mental health promotion? Yeah, I think I think personally, it's really big. I think the um, like, like I said earlier, there's certainly programmatic stuff that is required. The company needs to be able to stand that up. They need to be able to fund it. All those types of things need to happen. Um, but we have built and we believe really strongly in community, right? Community of people with shared experiences, community of people with shared needs or, or um, values, those types of things. And the opportunity to be able to connect, to support each other, to be able to educate, to be able to create allies and partnerships, to be able to leverage. Um, in, in our community, our, our partner networks play a really big role. They play a big role in crafting our strategic plan. They play a really big role in our inclusion and diversity programs. They play a really big role on what we stand for, right? And what we fund around um, you know, community grants or inside the company opportunities. So I think it's critically important for people to be able to see themselves in others, particularly to be able to see themselves in company leadership as well, um, but then to be able to have an a, a opportunity to be able to voice collective ideas and collective needs so that those can be gathered, then unlocked and enabled. So we partner a lot, both strategically as leaders with our partner networks, but I know the partnership and the support model within is really important. And, you know, for me, there's no, there, there is they're one in the same mental health and feeling included in a diverse community. They're not, you can't separate those two. There aren't two different right. paths or two different strategies. They are completely one in the same because you can't have one without the other. So things have to be absolutely ingrained, um, you know, around the, the programming and how you go about it. Back to that co-creation, I think. I'm watching our time carefully. I just want to spend a few minutes on, um, one of our goals in running these is to encourage people listening uh, or to facilitate information for people listening about how they can advance uh, their mental health programs in their workplaces. Uh, small and medium enterprises uh, do struggle with having the resources uh, to provide um, mental, wellness, mental wellness and mental health supports. I'm wondering what advice you have. You know, if somebody thinks, well, I don't have the resources to do this, but I know it's important to keep our employees healthy. Uh, not everything costs a lot of money, uh, but different size of businesses have different resources. What advice do you have for uh, folks who are listening who really are committed to doing better with this, but maybe don't have access to enormous resources to be able to advance major programs? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot you can do in the culture and also the offerings that you have. Like there are different um, apps in Canada that are funded by the government that have, you know, uh, talk therapy, et cetera, different programs. Um, one story, just building on Lori, what you were talking about on peer support, which is so important. I just stuck it in the, the chat was called the Blue Dot program. So this is something we have at Google. Um, you offer up to be a blue dot ambassador, you get some training, you actually put a blue dot on your, on your kind of like your Google tag that you walk around and people know that if they need someone to talk to, uh, if they're new and maybe they don't have the network or they're not part of the ERG kind of system yet, there is somebody there to talk to them. And I think that that is absolutely, um, 
really essential. So there's a lot that you can do just in terms of workplace culture. I think the other thing is, is the structuring of work and trying to remove some of the anxiety of the core job is also a really fundamental part of being a, a manager or a leader, right? Because detachment matters a lot. You want your people 100% focused at work, but you don't want them thinking about work at two in the morning. Uh, and so as much as you can help with structuring work, making expectations clear, but always you know, leaving enough for people to innovate and so on, right? I think that's really important. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Sabrina, I might have tried to cut you off there. Go ahead, Lori. Sorry. No, I, I think that's uh, absolutely right. And I think, you know, choosing, right? Choosing what you might do and then how do you, you don't have to do everything at once, right? But it's just progressing, you know, you know, year after year or month after month as well. And I agree with you that there, it doesn't matter what company you are, that is out there and there's hundreds and thousands of beautiful companies out there with incredible people. Find the person that's passionate about it. Find them, enable them. Like I love the blue dot. We have the kindness group blue at dot. Starbucks, right? right. Same, yeah. same kind. It's people that are passionate about doing something and really care. And how do you create a framework around them to be able to do what they've been gifted to be able to do? And that's an enormous way to unlock potential as well. And you know, I think one of the one of the biggest um, capabilities we have that anyone can do, right? Because of course, bigger companies can fund different things or have access to scale that others may not, but often they want to share, right? So how do you find a partner that has put out, you know, free resources or willing to share, you know, training programs or lend their individuals out for mentorship, things like that. That's an opportunity as well. Um, but I also think that a lot of it is accessing information. People just don't know where to turn. The, the right. One of the hardest things with mental health is, the, is it, what's getting in your way is just the ability to like sift through and, okay, I'm going to take this step and next step, right? So some of it is just making it easy. And I remember during the pandemic, we just had sort of what, like a, almost like a hotline kind of sheet, right? Here's where you go, can go to the, this just so it was at their fingertips and really clear. And so it would be different. But I think that's one of the biggest way th you know, benefits you can do is equip your leaders to be able to say, well, here, let's walk through these five things. Is there anything there that might be helpful? Um, and you don't have to create a big program for yourself as well. And I think it's important for everybody to know you don't arrive with the perfect program or perfect package. It's a continual evolution. And as your employee base changes, their needs are going to change. It's never a one size fits all. And as long as I think we're committing to doing better next month than we did this month, and getting feedback and getting to know what our employees need and just try to continue on that evolution because we never arrive. It's ne it's, the work doesn't end in this space, it, it continues. Um, so I, I, I wanna thank both of you uh, enormously for being so authentic. Um, uh, I, I'm sure your colleagues are very proud to work for both of your companies with all of the support uh, that is provided to them. And uh, I hope that um, other leaders out there uh, who maybe are not quite as far ahead as Starbucks and Google, um, you know, may listen to this and learn something. Uh, you're great role models. Uh, I thank you for your authenticity uh, as well. It's uh, very empowering and impressive uh, to know that you are so real and, and caring as leaders and uh, you're just tremendous role models. And we're very excited uh, to spotlight both of your organizations and the two of you as caring, compassionate uh, leaders and um, it, it's just uh, it's tremendous so um, if, unless you have any other final comments I'll, I'll bring us to a close and uh, I know there's going to be great interest in this video link um, after the fact and so this hour will live on for, for quite some time afterwards and we're very grateful for that any closing comments or remarks and if if you don't maybe you could tell me something you're most proud of goodness um, Akila, I, well, first of all, I'll say thank you because, um, you know, none of this would have been possible without you, right? And your desire to have this conversation and invite us to the conversation. And of course, all the, you know, incredible leaders that are, that are on the call. So I'll just say thank you to you because you, you know, this forum um, is going to make a difference. And then those individuals are going to make a difference based on their circle of influence as well. So, so thank you for that. You know, I think out of anything, if I was to say I'm most proud of, like, I'm just proud of, 
you know, it's, it's the human spirit for sure, but I am just so incredibly blown away with the strength of the human spirit and just individuals. And we see it with our partners, Dan, Akila, you had mentioned it, you know, they show up for homeless walk into the store. Someone is using the bathroom in a way and they just really need help. Right. Or, or, you know, someone who's trying to escape a situation. And I'm just so proud of the heart and the empathy and the resilience of people to be able to see someone in need and just say, I see you, I'm willing to help you. And that happens every day. It's so easy in our news streams to see all the stuff. And yes, there's all this stuff and we have to work through it and lead through it and make a change. But there's so much incredible beauty in the world. And I know you have it in each of your organizations as well. And the opportunity to see it and celebrate it. Um, you know, that that the times I've had that opportunity and I've seen it at Starbucks is without question my proudest moment. Um, because it made the difference in someone's life and it changed their world. Right. And if you can do that, I mean, what else would you want to do? I would say for me, I, I'm uh, similar, I'm very proud of my team and I'm proud of how. Um, they helped one another and they listened and they went the extra mile in extraordinary circumstances, but also the, how much how much people on my team give back to the community, I think is often under talked about, right? The, the mentoring that they do for underrepresented groups, um, the outreach that they do to train teachers. There was just such a hustle, especially in those first months of the pandemic, just to do whatever we could, like people helping, uh, like... Uh, helping volunteering at hospitals to figure out masks, all of these different things. Like, mm -hmm. and it came in such a time when you were like, you know, you had so much on your own plate. And I, it makes me so proud to know that people care and they want to have an impact on the community that they operate on and they care for one another. And I think the care is infectious. And I think that that is, uh, that's, that's what we need more of. Well, I think there's been some good things that have come of this pandemic. And if we can evolve our workplaces uh, to be more caring, supportive places, I think we will all benefit and businesses will benefit. Uh, once again, I thank the two of you. I know you are making an enormous difference every day in the lives of many. And I know you're shaping leaders uh, who report into you as well. Uh, so your authenticity and your focus on uh, empathy is living on, I know, beyond your own leadership desk. So thank you so much for being here today and sharing all of your insights. And thank you for the work that you're doing. It's been a distinct pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.